Hey, hello everybody, it's James here with WSI and this is part two of our little special of WrestleMania 38 reviewing with Joey Mercury. I'll, I'll forego the intro too much in case I, I will mess it up a second time. But Joey, hello, uh, t uh, two days, two days in a row we're doing this and uh, we're going to go through uh, WrestleMania night two. I'm looking forward to it. Good stuff. Uh, first thing I was going to bring up WrestleMania uh, 38, I'll just say what happens in the beginning. National Anthem by someone I've never heard of sings Christina Aguilera style, oversings it. Uh, Dirk Diggler does the introduction from Boogie Nights. And then the uh, sort of big story or the first big story from the night is Triple H coming down, wearing a suit, does the full entrance, the water spitting, all the music, the fans go crazy. And the point was that he's coming out there to leave his boots in the ring and retire for good. Uh, do you believe that he is going to be retired for good uh, with the heart attack or cardiac event issues uh, that have plagued him recently? And as far as like in-ring uh, performance, physicality-wise, uh, based off of what I saw in the ESPN interview, um, Hunter saying he has a defibrillator in his chest. Um, yeah, it's probably not a good idea for him to be an in-ring competitor at that point. And uh, he likes life. He likes his wife. He likes his kids. He you know, wants to enjoy it. So, and he, he doesn't need to do it. I, I think it was really, uh, it was cool. It, it was unannounced. He's been away. Um, it was nice for him to come out and uh, have, have some time. Nice for the live crowd. Nice way to start the show. What a huge name, you know, all time great. And uh, having him leave his boots in the ring, really nice on that stage, in that environment. Um, and very first thing of the night, post, he had to follow the Christina Aguilera and the Dirk Diggler, as he said. <laughs> but, uh, I think he did okay. And uh, leaving the boots out there, but more over than that, um, he welcomed us to WrestleMania, did he not? He did. And I think that'd be a very nice uh, first of very many where Triple H can come out at the top of the show and welcome the WWE universe to WrestleMania every year. Yeah. I uh, interviewed Diamond Dallas Page a week or two ago, and I happened to mention Triple H's name, uh, nothing about recent events, but um, he went off and said it really irks him when people online say, well, Triple H is so-and-so. Because DDP was like, he is such a great guy, and he does so much for so many people in that company, and he's a great company guy, that it really annoys him when people who don't know the situation criticize him. Uh, there's a reason I don't uh, hang out online too much. <laughs> um, you know, uh, text that I can read. Um, slighting somebody like Hunter um, and what he's done and what he continues to do is just irrelevant. It's not important. Uh, it doesn't irk me. Uh, <laughs> it damn sure doesn't irk Triple H. Triple H isn't sitting there reading comments. Believe me, he's too busy creating everything that people comment on. And uh, he, it, it's really, uh, it, it, it sounds like a cop out to say like there wasn't anything he didn't do or he did everything or was in charge of everything from NXT and WWE to, I mean, he had a hand in everything and a big hand. And um, it sound, it's like lazy for me to say everything is the man, but there's no, there's no articulate way to describe all of his duties and all the things he took on. I mean, I mean, I performed with him in the ring uh, 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was now. Um, and then I was able to perform with him again, like 10 years later, being in the authority with him. So like on camera, out there in front of the people, backstage, production meetings at headquarters in Stanford. Um, down in Florida for NXT, uh, just, man, every time I see him every day of the week, 
you know, and um, there wasn't anything he didn't do. And um, there's stories that uh, we'll probably share together uh, just to pique interest for anybody who gives a shit about us talking to each other about this and wants to watch it. Uh, but like, how did Samoa Joe come to NXT and change the entire industry? Right. And when you look back at what that did for everybody involved, I mean, that's why Tommaso Ciampa is at NXT. That's why Johnny Gargano could have a career. That's why Adam Cole, that's why all these guys at NXT came to NXT from the independents was Hunter. And it changed because they were still allowed to do third party bookings and they could keep their name and then they were worth more with their independence, but then because they, they had the NXT and then NXT could use them to gain credibility and it uh, made the wrestling world a smaller world. And um, there was, he facilitated a lot of change for a lot of guys. And um, I, I don't, anybody who uh, thinks that he hasn't done a good job, like, okay. Well, you're right. He hasn't done a good job. He's still going to work today and you'll still complain about him. So whatever, but there's nobody better. I mean, every, like all day long, like you see him at the production meeting, he's at the head table with Vince and Ed Kosky, the head writer of raw and Kevin Dunn. Right. And, um, as the showrunner runs the show, he's there at the head of the table and, um, just, after the production meeting, you know, he's in meetings all day with creative and rehearsals and running rehearsals and doing backstage vignettes. And, hey, Hunter, do you have a minute for this guy? And, hey, Hunter, do you have a minute for this girl? And uh, he's got to get his meal from, you know, catering. And, like, uh, he's got to get his gear on. And he's got to sit in Gorilla. And he's got to go out to the truck. And then he's got to get on the phone because there's an international live event uh, issue. And then there's a talent that he's trying to sign from the NFL. And then there's a, uh, you know, then we're going to do the show and be in four segments on air and two segments backstage. And then we're also going to run the show from gorilla. And then we're going to get in the limo and then we're going to go to FBO and get on a private plane after SmackDown and go down to uh, Orlando on the private jet for NXT the next day. And then just do it all over again. But at six or seven in the morning, he's going to be at the performance center getting the workout in at the gym before it all goes down. And um, man, like the work ethic, uh, he's a really good person. He's been a really good person to me, really good person to me. And uh, the smartest guy probably I've ever been around. So maybe I've learned more from Vince maybe I don't know. It's hard to say, but there's hunters uh, on a different level. Can um, can I ask you uh, for an example then of something you've learned from Hunter or some memorable interaction you had in a production meeting where he really made a situation or something that happened on TV much better with his input? He was really and I'm sure he still is. I just don't work with him, but he's um, such a natural. Um, I can't really give an example and this, because it'd be weird and odd and the exception and not the rule if he couldn't make something fit. Here's, here's the thing about Hunter, and this is a good filter, too, that I always use. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't told to me. It's my own filter, but I apply it to these guys, and I can see. And my own experience is something I've used to kind of vet for myself before I pitch something to Vince or I pitch something to somebody who's a decision maker. And that's... Um, can I see it? Can I envision it, what I'm thinking of? Can I? Okay, so like say the idea is to have this match and get into a finish where the referee's knocked down, but then here comes a run in and we're all out at the ring at Raw and trying to figure a way to get into it or a special 
spot in the match or maybe some camera work or something, you have an idea and it's, can I see it? Can I envision what's going down? Can I explain it to somebody? Second part is, okay, just because I can see it doesn't mean I can feel it. So can I feel it? Now that I can see it, can I feel it? I have an opportunity to feel it. Can I feel it? But it don't stop there. The trick is, is it the right feeling? Right? But first you have to lay it out and envision it, like how people are going to see it and how they're going to process this information. So Hunter was always so good about taking time and letting things marinate and let things process and letting people digest what they're getting and concentrate on what the takeaway is and being very logical about, um, well, why wouldn't he just do this? Like, why would you, um, well, why would you take the uh, stairs and come up with a lie as opposed to taking the elevator and telling the truth, right? Like there's just an easier, more straightforward way that everybody would understand. And as long as the execution is brilliant because you're a trained performer and you're excellent at your craft, then it's going to be great. You know, it's where people get too complicated and try to, uh, if it's too complicated for somebody to understand uh, that you're pitching it to, the people at home are not going to get it. So Hunter was really good about, you know, making stuff fit. And he was really good about um, his role because I would see him all the time, whether it was at WWE TV or the office or down at NXT in Orlando or the performance center. Um, you know, he'd, he'd have time for just about anybody who was worth the time, you know, and he was, I, I've seen him too, where people uh, have approached him and they say, hey, Hunter, do you have a minute? And it's been, no, or not for you. And, I, and I've seen him where, hey, Hunter, do you have a minute? Um, yes, I will, but not right now. Uh, come see me and whatever, right? And so, like, that would, um, he was just really good about being upfront and to the point. In my experience with him, you're going to find people who talk shit about him, like uh, uh, people online, right? The people yeah. who've never met him, basically. Right. The people in the know. Hmm. Yeah. People, people who are, uh, yeah. Yeah, people who are valid and credible sources, like the people in the online wrestling community <laughs> that despise Triple H. But oh. to, to sum it up, I think it's very nice for uh, a very nice debut as far as like maybe uh, the role he took on at NXT and a lot of NXT specials where, um, you know, you come up on the air and the house would be blacked out. The boards and stage would be blacked out. And you get a spotlight on Triple H in the middle of the ring. And you say, we are NXT, you know, or welcome to NXT or whatever it is. And that's another thing about him. He took so much pride in NXT. My goodness, man. Uh, it's just incredible. Incredible. And I, anybody who um, I, I think you saw, I guess the online wrestling community, uh, would be online uh, people who never met him. Who's on the online wrestling commu community who are actually in the wrestling community who are online, like on Twitter? Because the outpouring of thank you, Hunter, and, uh, you know, um, the best to ever do it, and just the gratitude that was shown to him from people who actually knew him and still know him to this day and work with him, it's not a lot of um, varying opinions from people who actually coexist with them. <clears throat> people, other people's uh, inadequacies or insufficient uh, nature could get them uh, on the wrong side of Hunter pretty quick. But. But no, I think that's a, a fine, fine tribute to uh, Triple H there. Absolutely fine tribute. Uh, we'll move on to our first match and we've traded notes. Or say you've seen my notes and you said to me before, Almost to the point that we agreed on absolutely everything in our next match here is RK Bro versus the Street Profits versus Alpha Academy. And, you know, the crowd loved it, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I think it went the right amount of time, and it got the right reaction, and sort of sent the people home happy. Uh, it went to the floor, I think. Uh, this match actually went to, out to the floor, but it, it, 
it, what, it went to the floor. What would happen if, um, I don't know, say Angelo Dawkins got counted out? I don't know. Is it no DQ, all triple threat matches now? I mean, it seems very well, confusing. Let me ask you this. What would happen if somebody didn't stand on the apron and came into the ring illegally? Nothing. Because there's a, I think it was no DQ, or at some point then, someone may have said no then, DQ. Then why, why are they standing on the apron holding a rope? A wonderful question. Why are they? No, no, no. Why are they? Because they were told to. Hmm. Okay. So, I can't really get into a story of a wrestling contest, a match, which is what I like to do if I'm a wrestling fan, which I used to be and kind of still am for um, performances that can get me lost in it and keep my disbelief suspended. Um, having rules really helps in keeping my, because it's kind of like, kind of like having laws out there on the street, out in public, you know, with other people, you know, and um, like there's a limit to how many civilized Bloody Marys you can have on an airplane. Right. There's laws because all of a sudden if there's no laws in one place. Then why are the laws in another place? And if there's no laws five minutes ago, why are there laws 30 seconds from now? And then there's not going to be laws anymore. So it's very confusing to me. So therefore, my disbelief has gone to the highest level. And I know I'm a snob and I know like I have a like tolerance that's very low for whatever. So then I just have to go, OK, these guys are all fucking fantastic athletes. And. I think to a man, uh, good performers, you know, and interesting characters. Um, so then it becomes a point of I'm watching for the displays of athleticism, maybe. Uh, I'm watching for uh, what sort of uh, movements they get into or uh, how intricate their athletic movements are. It's basically just a stunt show at that point. And it's uh, fireworks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Guy Fox Day or Fourth of July, if you will, or if you won't, they should set off fireworks. So, like, you go out and you see the fireworks, and it's a lot of ooh and ah. But, like, two weeks from now, like, we just saw the fireworks last night. I'm not going to say, hey, man, you remember that purple one that was like third to last that like went off and had like the blue things and kind of like crackled? And you might go, I don't fucking know. Okay, like there's no emotional connection to it, right? But I can go, hey, James, like, um, you remember like times in your life where you, uh, like, uh, your, your heart was so broken and you just cried your eyes out. You remember times where like you got so angry that you wanted to punch a wall or did worse, or like you were so happy that you cried tears of joy when you were so excited about something that you couldn't sleep, or like, you know, just terrified, any sort of emotion. You know, you latch on to that and that's what gets over because that's what people connect with. Mm -hmm. And so the fireworks display is a lot like nobody in the crowd really knows too much about what anything would feel like in the confines of parameters of physicality that you see in a wrestling ring. Um, they can't uh, connect with that or identify with it because they don't know. In other words, nobody knows exactly what, um, I don't know, uh, 619 feels like. You know, nobody really knows what, um, I don't know, a Claymore kick or the skull crushing finale or any move in a wrestling match, right? Um, people know what it's like to, like, get their hair pulled, maybe. You poke yourself in the eye. You... Uh, choke on something, you drink something, it goes down the wrong pipe. Uh, uh, very few things. Guys know what it's like to get hit in the nuts, maybe. Girls know what it's like, you know, because they've seen the low blows and maybe they've conducted one themselves. If they're, you know, 
if they're so situated and like they've seen the effect of that. Uh, I don't know. People bite their tongue sometimes. Sometimes you drop something underneath the desk and you go and pick it up and you bang back your head on the table. Very few things you can identify with. So that's why people might latch on to those simple things like a nut shot or like pulling the hair or like an eye poke or things like that. People always identify with that. Go, oh, and they always believe it because that's something that happens in day-to-day -day life. When you go into the top rope RKOs <laughs> and you go into like the dives out over the top and you go into, you know, uh, like the, the rip cord and high knee and zaguris and things like that. I mean, I don't know. People are going to identify with it. So they're just going to watch it like that fireworks display. But as I'm recalling movements that I saw just earlier today, because I had to refresh myself because I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember those fireworks either. So what did I feel about that match? I don't know. You know, the, the rules are crazy to me. How Like, you're just supposed to like, okay, throw it out the window. It's all a spectacle at this point, you know. But at the very end of it, uh, a babyface team went over and the crowd were on their feet and they were screaming. And, uh, yeah, and, and they were happy about it. So, like, that's, uh, that's a really good match. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I'm going to ask you this then. Uh, I was going to ask you something about Randy Orton, but I've changed my mind about the question. You were with Randy Orton in OVW, were you? Uh, we had just missed each other in uh, OVW. We got there, he had just left. But uh, I was with Randy the following year when I started on the main roster. Uh, I worked with Randy. Um, yeah, I've worked with Randy as a talent, as his producer, uh, yeah, as, as an agent, like probably over the course of probably like 15 years or so, 10, 15 years. Yeah. Well, I was and, and we used to travel together. We, we've, we've had times, we spent time together. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, uh, could you tell us a fun Randy Orton story that doesn't get him in too much trouble? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, you have to define fun, <clears throat> right? Uh, fun is very subjective, and I don't know uh, if um, Kim has the same idea as fun that Randy used to. Uh, Randy's type of fun has changed over the years, right? Mm. Uh, it's a different kind of fun. But uh, that, maybe you ask another question. Okay, uh, a funny story. Is that not different enough a question? Um. Yeah, I don't. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no reason to like embarrass anybody. It's, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, then. Uh, well, I'll ask this then. Uh, when do you think Randy Orton? Because as far as I can tell, obviously I've never met the man. When did he sort of change from the old Randy Orton to the new Randy Orton? Because I remember hearing interviews back in 2006 that he gave where he was talking about having to go to anger management and. That kind of thing. Uh, when did the change come in Randy when he became more mature? Uh, it was after the anger management time frame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anger management took place in Atlanta, Georgia. And I know that because um, my first week of uh, assessment for my rehabilitation for substance abuse and alcoholism in 2006, and Randy and I were um, like, roommates at a rehab facility oh <laughs> we're straight off the main roster at the same time this is um summer of 2006 so like yeah like um randy um randy has had a past but randy grew up in the business and then he grew up in the business i don't just mean like he grew up because his dad and his uncle and his granddad were in the business i mean like he grew up from age 21, 22, something in the business all the way to where he is now, 42 years old. So, and, and yeah, he's, he has matured and, and, and it took, uh, it took every bit of it. Like he's more mature today than he was a week ago. You know, Randy, uh, Randy's evolved and yeah, what a run, you know? Yeah. I will. Uh, I'll move on from Randy, and we'll go to the next que uh, question. The next match, excuse me. Uh, Omas versus Almighty Bobby Lashley. Now, the only comment I made from this is that, well, I made several, but that uh, Omas makes 
Bobby Lashley looked like the hated kid in there. Yeah, or smaller. <laughs> yeah, it's uh that almost he's a he's a big guy, huh? Yeah. Can I um, yeah. I, I mean I'm sure I'll I'll mention something I'm sure you'll add on it is anyway, as a giant. Uh he puts a claw on Bobby Lashley. And you're working for seventy thousand, whatever they build the thing for. And instead yeah. of doing the even giant Gonzalez would have done this, the big arm back, rah, bang on the head, you know, make a big deal of it. Whereas Omos just went like that. Yeah. And there was like no build up to it or anything like that. I, I think um he doesn't know how to work as a giant from my point of view. What do you think? Oh um, man, I think Omos is a big guy, man. Yeah. <laughs> God, he's big, isn't he? Yeah, he's big. Ask, a, okay, here, ask me what I think of his work. What do you think of his work? Oh, man, he's big, isn't he? <laughs> how many, when you were producing, when you were working, how many big guys came through and you, they just couldn't get it? They couldn't work out how to be a giant and then just disappeared just as quickly? Oh. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, It's kind of double sided there because it's not only do guys not know how to work like a giant, guys don't get booked properly who are giants, you know, as giants sometimes. I mean, my God, like uh, Big Show, I've known Big Show a long time and worked with him back uh, when I was in my 20s and I worked with him when I was in my 30s in the office and like on TV and on the road and um, like what an exceptional talent, like, and such a hard worker and he puts out his time and like, he just, he really cares. And uh, he's another guy who's matured throughout the years. And um, how many times has he been a heel and a baby face over the years? You know, how, how much? over 30 switches in his career. Is that real? Yeah. I think it's at least 30, probably more. Okay, I was just, I didn't know that was a thing, or like people knew it. Yeah, somebody That's actually just what came went, to mind. Yeah, someone's actually catalogued every single one from his debut in WCW. Okay, well, then I might be on to something here mm. if people are noticing that, because then it's hard to get behind the guy or believe in the guy. And he's so overexposed, you know, like Andre, as far as like a national audience or global audience. Uh, and I know, like, uh, yeah. Andre, like back when it was in black and white, whatever, uh, before the internet and shit. But like, he had the run as a baby face, right? Being booked out by Vince's dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he had the turn on Hogan, right? Which uh, it, it drew a couple bucks, right? <laughs> and then uh, turn back baby face to kind of wind down his career when he turned on Bobby Heenan and after they dropped the uh, tag titles demolition, I think, and uh, they turned Andre back babyface, and then that was it, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't overexposed, though. It's still special to see Andre the Giant. And so, like, with Omos, like, he's big. No, but it's really hard to not overexpose somebody, right? Like, you know, I heard that... Um, Okay, so like talking about being desensitized to stuff, I think it was, uh, I think it was Dr. Tom, probably Dr. Tom, saying like uh, back in Tampa and FCW being desensitized to stuff. I don't know if he said it or I said it to him or he made it, I don't know. He probably made it up. But I remember being there with him and saying like, um, I don't care about authorship. It's the dumbest thing ever, but it makes a lot of sense. He, uh, so imagine like, Somebody comes in the first day in the FCW, and uh, we've been here as long as we've been here. There's a, there's a stoop that goes down right outside uh, on the side doors, FCW, come in the room with two rings, an office, offshoot from the studio. And uh, there's two uh, giant African elephants, and they're fucking each other right there by the door stoop, right? And, um, you know, the newcomer probably come in and say, hey, what the fuck? Somebody come here and be like, what, the elephants? And go, yeah, what the fuck? Yeah, the elephants, they, 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 they fuck each other on Tuesdays. Right? <laughs> so then, like, 
uh, I'm probably modifying this shit, but like next Tuesday comes in and the guy's been there a week and he's like, man, I can't believe it. So like, oh, you guys know, I can't believe I get to see it again, whatever. So then he sees the two elephants that are fucking right. Weeks go by, weeks go by, weeks go by, five, six weeks. Another newcomer comes in. Hey, what the fuck? Six week guy, veteran of the elephant fucking sight scene. Yeah, so all oh, what the elephants? Yeah, they fuck here every Tuesday. So you get desensitized to that shit, man, mm-hmm. because that actually happened at FCW with the elephants. There was thirty six switches. Thirty six switches. The big That's show. That's yeah. noteworthy. I just broke a bombshell that we had elephants fucking outside of FCW every <laughs> Tuesday. You don't care. Oh well, I see it every Tuesday. You guys got that out there too. Yeah, <laughs> is that what they did at Wigan? Well, the elephant fucking yeah in the nineteen twenties, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Oh my gosh, a snake pit. Yeah, man. I, I, wow. I uh, this is something of nothing. I thought Adrian Street did the snake pit, and then I said, "Oh, you're in the snake pit." And he went, "No." I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I was a massive downer." Really? Yeah, I thought he was, but he wrestled a lot of people from the snake pit. Just before I forget about this match, um, Omas does like a bear hug, sort of drive into the corner, and Bobby Lashley, he's too high up. And he bends right over backwards and smashes the back of his head on the post. Yeah. How is he alive? Um, yeah, I don't know. His dumb luck, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, um, yeah, you don't really want to take bumps or anything where you can't see where you're going and kind of like take your own bump if you, uh, if you don't know the guy you're in there with. And then especially sometimes if you do know the guy you're in there with, right? So it's important to know who you're in there with. And um, yeah, that Omos, his, uh, his execution on some of those things, right? Mm. It, um, gosh, he's big. He's a, gosh. He's a big man. Um, this is something I normally ask on my regular show, but I thought I'd ask you is any particular wrestler that you wrestled once or maybe even more than once that you were just – Terrified for your life because they were so clumsy, or they're just two left feet, or just it always seemed to go wrong and you always seem to get hurt. Uh, maybe never get hurt. There's guys who, um, there's guys who work close, you know, there's guys who work snug, tight, and everything. Uh, and that I like that, that's welcome, that's how it should be. Um, uh, especially TV, you know, uh, nothing's dark anymore though. So just full time. I mean, that's how you should work. I think there's nothing where it would reinstate disbelief. Um, and there's some guys who are more heavy handed than others, but relatively safe where you can, you know, do it the next night. And there's guys who throw potatoes and guys who are just two left feet. And you can kind of, uh, there's been sporadic, like on the independence, like I don't, I wouldn't trust anybody to do much of anything, you know. Um, and then when I was working on TV, I didn't really work with like a lot of underneath talent, you know. The guys I was in there with were pros, even if they weren't main event guys or like uh, top guys or WrestleMania main events. I mean, I wasn't a WrestleMania main event. I was a TV main event a lot, but. Um, yeah, no, I was fortunate. And then the guys who were kind of like, you know, uh, how do I put this nicely? They were big guys, right? Uh, you kind of just set them in the middle and have a match around them. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, yeah, and I've had some good teachers over the years, and a lot of it is, um, you know, ex- ex- exploiting – the positives and camouflaging the negatives or hiding them completely. I like camouflaging the negatives because then at least you can use the negatives for something disguised in another way than just totally being rid of it. And sometimes that's nice. Other times you do want to shed the skin and find one positive thing about the person, just amplify it. But then if you, the deal is everybody gets exposed for better or for worse sooner or later. If you can't hang, you're going to get exposed. If you're full of shit, you're going to get exposed. If you're lying, you're going to get exposed. Omas is a big and guy. And if you're, 
if you if you have a good eye for talent like you do, you'll get exposed for that, which is what you just said, Omas. Mighty big fella. I'm sorry I crapped all over your punchline then. You were probably going to say the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. I will uh we'll, we'll move on. We'll 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 repair this relationship eventually over time for my uh, horrible faux pas. Were you surprised at that finish? Who won? Was it Lashley? Uh no. Um <laughs> I I'd even forgot who won. Uh Sami Zayn and Johnny Knoxville. Uh the question before we talk about that is who are the best celebrities you ever produced or worked with? Oh, probably Vince McMahon. Outsider. Let's say outsider, outside the wrestling bubble. I'd say... Um, maybe um, guys like... Uh, there's a... American comedian. He hosts uh, the Daily Show. Uh, John it's called Stewart. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, an actor, a uh, voice actor from Family Guy, but he's also a stage screen actor. Seth, Seth Green. McFarlane. No, Seth Green. Seth Green, sorry. Yeah. Not the, not the producer, the creator, the uh, talent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those two guys were a lot of fun. I worked with them on uh, on air, like some on air stuff out in the ring, and you know, had a hand in producing it. It's been good. You have to when you're hands on. You're kind of like do the job for your producer, kind of report back to him. At least that's what I always did. I didn't. I got told what um, what was wanted or what was desired, and then I kind of like um, had my own thoughts about it, and kind of went with that, and then. From there, either I needed to tweak something or leave something out or add something or just leave it how I had it. Um, but those two guys were uh, a lot of fun uh, because they were huge fans. Like, and that really came across like they had a lot of fun. So that's what made it fun. It was like, you know, they were so ecstatic to be there, like backstage when you meet them. Like they look at you and you're like, they're like, oh, we watch you every week, me and my son, you know, whatever that's John Stewart was saying. And he had his son there and uh, a couple times and just like, you're so amped to be there and be a part of it. You're like, it's fucking John Stewart, man, this is awesome. So they're like super nice and wanted to go the extra mile. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really okay if I stand here like this. Is it okay if I smile here? Is it okay if I say this? And they're just, uh, they're having a blast. And, uh, that makes it a lot of fun. I've seen uh, there's two um, chat show hosts over here called uh, Kathy Lee Gifford and uh, Hoda Kotb, and the uh, uh, Today Show, I think, on NBC. And uh, yeah, and they showed up for a spot in um, in Brooklyn one time. Uh, in ring, you know, they were the hosts of the show, or they were there for um, maybe breast cancer awareness or some promotional thing, maybe some community outreach of some sort. But um, yeah, one of, if not both, were like, you know, in their cups and in their pill bottles all day and just fabulous women. And just, yeah, it's like uh, herding cats there, you know, like trying to wrangle them. Like you're a cowboy, but you're trying to like herd cats instead of cattle with talent like that who were like kind of uh, flighty and flaky and you know it's a it's a big ask sometimes but to answer your question i'd say john stewart and seth green yeah uh, you weren't there for the celebrity host period where you weren't producing at that time i was uh no i was a coach in florida then yeah uh one more person i'll bring up is did freddie prince jr were you there when he was a writer yes um 2010 I came back as a talent for a while before I got into the office. Yeah. Was it just a bit weird seeing the guy from Scooby-Doo, like, handing you scripts? Uh, no, no. <laughs> it's, uh, it's weird to see, like, an unsuccessful person I've never heard of who's never been in the ring or done anything hand you script. Yeah. Um, yeah, you actually want somebody's input who kind of, like, been successful and you know, is a fan and wants to be there. And that's that's the impression I got from Freddie Prince. I had limited interaction with him. Like, I don't remember too much. I might have more than I remember, but 
just that he, um, he wasn't a problem. And as far as like celebrities being on the show, like, um, man, I got to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, I didn't work with him or produce him or anything like that, but like, there's celebrities that I've met that just been like, man, that's pretty fucking cool. Like, I wouldn't have bumped into him otherwise. You know, yeah. I mean, they weren't there to see me. We're not friends, but it's just, you know, it's nice to, uh, nice to meet people sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sami Zayn, Johnny Knoxville, then the match. You can talk about anything. You can take any angle you want from it. What did you think of it? Or you can talk about something completely different if you want to. Um, I think... Uh, I think the live crowd loved it. And I think it's something that once you started watching or once I started watching, I had no interest in anything else going on. I wanted to continue to watch it. And I think that it was very, very um, ambitious, maybe <laughs> as far as like trying to, uh, trying to put a match out there that would incorporate things that, um, we're true to both uh, what Sami Zayn does and what Johnny Knoxville does without insulting people's intelligence too much. I think I think it followed that line, and I, I think it uh, I think it played really well into um, being a comedy match that didn't reinstate my disbelief too much because it's such a far fetched fucking like goofball. Um, enterprise to get involved with anyway that if you've seen the jackass films and you have oh yeah so if you see the jackass films you see them rig up structures you see them rig up uh things like that big hand that smacks Sami Zayn when he was running around you see these things you see mark it's henry not a i'm sorry to interrupt. That? mark henry posted uh that that was uh his child with may young it finally grew up and made it to wrestlemania <laughs> right and uh <laughs> by way of the smackdown fist correct yes 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 see i when i debuted on smackdown with an actual gimmick and not just with a jobber it's all about the fist <laughs> so yeah i'm a fist guy so like um that the whole thing uh it, it wasn't far-fetched to see Sami Zayn on the top rope and johnny knoxville pull out this and then the sparkler shoots up Sami Zayn's backside, distracts him, and he loses his balance and crosses himself into the ring. Um, I'll speak to, like, why didn't Johnny Knoxville use that earlier? Okay, Sami Zayn was, uh, you know, not in the corner earlier. So mm -hmm. it was okay for that. And it, it didn't, uh, so, so it didn't, like, I, I wanted to see what they were going to do next. And, yeah, it was far-fetched. It was goofy. But Sami Zayn is a fucking star and Sami Zayn is made like he is sorry hold on man um yeah so Sammy um he can do anything he can be WWE for life that was incredible performance I thought I really did and like did you notice that the big mousetrap there was a botch I Right, this is absolutely true. Uh -huh. I was sure that the big mouse trap wouldn't work, and to save my own embarrassment, I skipped twenty seconds to when it still wasn't working. Mm -hmm. I just now, I knew it wouldn't work. Right, and you got to think like, there's probably those online that were like, "Oh, the mouse trap botch," right? So like, and you think like historically of all like the giant novelty mouse traps that have been involved in WrestleMania matches, high profile matches like this, this has got to be the most recent one. <laughs> who, who builds these things? Cause I, I know a name from the past was Richie Posner who used to build all just whatever you needed building for a prop or whatever for wrestling. He was the guy you would go to and he would make it. Uh, is there somebody else on WWE staff who's just like knows everything about construction and how to build all these props? 
Yeah. So like uh, Richie Posner back then, uh, it wasn't called props. It was called magic. Uh, and they would have a sign that said magic uh, next to the wardrobes and little uh, cases that people had. Richie's area would be back there. And that's just like, you need to throw fire if you need to go make a blade, if you need to, uh, yeah, have a prop, get sugar glass for something, get, get anything, right? And so uh, Richie left the company and when he did, uh, there's a couple guys, uh, Ellis Edwards came over from WCW. And Ellis is a guy who knows everything, man, about like the hell in the cell. And when I was in the hell in the cell match, he, uh, he knew how to tape up my boots so they wouldn't get caught on the inserts where I need to climb to get to the top of the cell to do my physicality on top of the cell. And he was a guy I'd like to walk you through everything. And if you needed a car, like when uh, Seth Rollins ended up gifting us a uh, Cadillac, that we drove around Chicago and then had Brock Lesnar tear apart. Like Ellis was the one who taught us how to drive it. Ellis is a race car driver and a stuntman. So like anything you need, Ellis would be on it and do it. Like if um, it'd be in, uh, those guys would be in charge of like when JBL had a limo to drive out, or Eddie had his low rider or anybody has anything that's not walking out through the curtain down the ramp. Um, and then Jason Robinson, uh, it is so valuable to Vince and WWE. Jason Robinson is the guy who builds all the sets and is in charge. Of, I mean, he's not the one, he's not swinging a hammer necessarily all the time, but he has an eye and a vision. So if you see those WrestleMania sets the other night with a huge star and just the the staging right and everything that comes with it the logos and the banners and all that that's jason robinson mm -hmm. and uh he's his wife works for a company too in the production field and um he's always sat in his station right underneath where the hard camera is so you never see him on tv or anything like that but jason's the one like you see the other night cody rhodes coming up from underneath the stage Right. That's going to be like Jason in conjunction with like Kevin Dunn and then the director, whoever that might be on the evening uh, and Vince and whoever the agent might be. It's just all coordinated and, and it, none of it happens by accident. Uh, I could honestly bore you to tears and um, probably everybody else with all questions that I find more interesting, like the guys who make the props. The mm -hmm. rigging, the setting up of the rings, even the catering. I actually, someone actually gave, uh, who was like the catering manager for WWE a few years ago, a giant interview about the logistics of it, of, of moving all this stuff uh, from arena to arena every week and, and you know, catering to people's needs. And that's the kind of thing I find interesting, but it, I, I'm sorry, I don't think it's the kind of thing that most people will find interesting, but that's just me. Um, because we're, I'm not even halfway through the script and we're definitely more than halfway through. Uh, uh, how long we need to go? Uh, Naomi Lamborghini. Uh, sorry, is Naomi tagging with a Lamborghini versus Liv Morgan, Rhea Ripley versus Shayna Baszler slash Natty Neidhart versus Queen Zelina, the third queen of the weekend behind Charlotte and Jarmel uh, and Carmella. And I think we should skip that entirely, unless there's something you're desperate to uh, impart about that match. Um, a one fall. Four team match means there's no disqualification. Maybe. I don't know. It would have to. They all stood on the ring apron for a while, apart from the times when they didn't. Yes. And the match went to the floor. So I hear, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's of no consequence. I just noticed watching the match, uh, and this is not to take away or give anything to any other talent. But there came a time before any contact was made where Sasha Banks was tagged in and Rhea Ripley was legal. And the two had a face off and the crowd was rumbling a bit. And I was just picturing everybody else on the apron, drop off, go away. I'm looking at a potential WrestleMania draw right here. Like you build it for like six, nine months out from SummerSlam to WrestleMania and next year, and you have Rhea Ripley and Sasha Banks. The match was fucking atrocious. You have great talent in there. 
it was horrible. There were no rules, but then we were supposed to be told and believe that the rules mattered. Um, it, it doesn't make sense. Rhea Ripley, who actually looks like um, money to me anyway, if properly protected and booked, is just cannon fodder for every single uh, talent who's not named Rhea Ripley in there. And then at the end of it, we're supposed to um, be convinced that she's intimidating or that she's a, uh, a force to be reckoned with and that nobody ought to fuck with her, even though she's been fucked with the whole time. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Nobody in those kind of matches get over at all. There's no way to give the people anything they want. The people don't know what they want at that point. And unless you're as athletically gifted as the Street Profits and Gable and um, Otis, right, and uh, Randy and Matt Riddle, so where it's just an athletic display and just a physicality exhibition when you're sloppy and there's no rules and it doesn't make sense. And then when you do physicality, the execution is shit. It's like what you hear sometimes. Um, and this is a perfect example of tying them together. Randy Orton will do a difficulty of one and an execution of 10. Because Randy likes to bat 1,000. He likes to do it 100% of the time. He does not like to leave anything to chance. And again, uh, that's why Randy's consistent, and that's why Randy's great. Let me get back to that. With the girls' match, it was a difficulty of 10 and an execution of one. And that's where you lost me. And I believe you asked me maybe off air about Randy and why he's great. I Even wrote that in the notes. Have... Yeah, I wrote that yeah. in the notes. And um, I'll specifically say what I said was Randy yeah. Orton, maybe at one point, had a reputation of being a great wrestler who never had that many great matches. Mm. Okay. Is that something you believe? Maybe at some point, yeah. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it slightly. Is a great wrestler who never had the most entertaining matches. Um, okay. I, I don't agree. Uh, wrestling is subjective, as we talk about. It's, it's up to you what you like and you don't like. Randy's had a career there for 20 years on top, on top the whole time. And um, it's like it'd be noticeable if Randy had a shitty match. It'd be really noticeable if he went out there and shit the bed and wasn't completely confident and didn't know exactly what he was going to do and what he was doing and why and when to do it, like with his timing and his purpose and his reasoning and his execution. And my God, look at his fucking athleticism and that body he's got and his look and his promo. He's got everything. He's, he's He is the total package. He's an all-time great. And it's scary and it's not fair how good he is. The thing about Randy you say, like, well, he doesn't have a history of, like, you know, standout great matches and shit, right? And so, like, I use an example from, um, there's a nitwit, like, in Northern California who's got, like, uh, printouts, like, all over his floor, and he writes about, you know, stars and how many uh, stars a wrestling match gets. San Jose-based. Like, maybe, yeah, why not? Okay. So then, uh, yeah, for example, perhaps, hypothetically, he gives... Um, uh, blank, blank, I don't know, Okada, for example. And um, I don't know, probably like some guy named like I don't know, Kenneth something or other. And he says they have a seven star match, right? And he said like, people are always talking about these guys, you know, with the five star matches, you know, and like Randy Orton's never had like a five star match, you know? It was like, no. Uh, People are always talking about Randy Orton. Nobody knows who these five-star match guys are at all, right? Randy Orton has been consistently great in everything he's done for as long as he's been doing it. My opinion, my experience. I think um, to sort of quantify my opinion, not that you asked uh, or not that anyone cares, I'm sure, uh, is that I he, care. He, he would not be the person I would look forward to seeing most on a card. Okay. 
and and, um, that, and that's not me saying he's not great. That's not me not saying that he's ever had a bad match. Then he is obviously a constant. Uh, but he's not somebody I would particularly look forward to over somebody. I don't know somebody else on a card. Let's say I don't know. I've got no examples to give. Is, is that because you feel like once you've seen Randy, you've seen Randy? Maybe. I think the thing that excites me the most about professional wrestling or excited me the most about professional wrestling was the personality and the interviews. The wrestling's secondary to it. As uh, we said yesterday, it's look, promo, wrestling in that order. And he's obviously got a 10 out of 10 look. I'm sure the wrestling's great, but uh, but I never felt that Randy connected with me in a way that excited me and encouraged me to buy a ticket for him. Understood. Uh, okay, so oh, well, I've uh, I've sort of gone more in depth of anything I've ever said on the show before, but I'll move on. Uh, AJ Styles, like AJ Styles versus Edge. Okay, this was a twenty-four minute vehicle to get Damian Priest to stand next to Edge. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know who it was. I was just like, who's this guy who looks a bit like Roman Reigns stood there because he had the vest on. Uh, Damian Priest is a. Uh... So you're a first time viewer. Apparently so, yeah. I didn't know yeah, who so, this guy so was. So might at need all. some yeah, might need some explanation. Um Damian Priest is a great talent. I've uh, been around the business a long time, a couple decades probably. And um they they've been pushing him and using him and he's uh he's he's cut from the cloth of those who get pushed by them and used by them. He can he can do anything and for as long as uh, as he wants to, especially now, is evident by the end of this thing. Being aligned with Edge is something that's going to give him a rub that I, and elevate him uh, past what he was doing. And it's um, it's good to see because that guy, once he gets elevated, he's going to stay there and he's going to be there and he's good. He's good in the ring. He look he looks like a man. He sounds like a man. The shit he does in the ring, he believed that he could do it. And, uh, yeah, his promo's good. Um, but, like, logically, to me, this is the shits. And, like, um, it, it doesn't make any sense. There are several times that AJ Styles went out to the apron in an attempt or to show that he wanted to connect with this uh, phenomenal form. The fuck was Damian Priest? Like, he got really lucky that AJ didn't connect with those first two attempts, right? Thank God he came out on the third one and knew what it was going to be. <laughs> A 24-minute vehicle to get Damian Priest and Edge to stand next to each other? Edge was fucking hitting AJ Styles with a concerto on the video package, crushing his skull. Seven minutes in, we get an abdominal stretch. What am I watching? Like, how is this at all consistent with what you want me to believe about this? And near falls for the sake of near falls. There's no consequence. Who cares? Like, they're going for all these wins. What do you win if you win? It would seem like this would be the time for AJ to get a receipt from that goddamn edge trying to break his head apart with a chair. Can I, um, can I interject here and say, I don't Please. know who said this, but... Um... I, maybe it was Steve Austin or someone else that I heard say, nothing like a grudge match, a blood grudge match where somebody's been wronged for months on end and then they finally meet in the ring and they start with a lockup. Yeah. Have you ever been so angry with somebody that you started with a lockup? Oh, man. Um, no. I've never been that angry. I've never been pushed to that <laughs> level of anger that I'd want to, like, you know, um, like up with them. Oh, uh, yeah. I would hate to think about what would cause me to push me to that point. I'd have to, like, you know, I'd have to fucking get in touch with Randy somehow to see if that anger management place is still open. Because I wouldn't want that again. No. Oh. With uh, Damien Priest, uh, we'll we'll talk about him for a minute more. Uh, you, you said when he finally gets the right vehicle to put him into the main event, he will be over for good. Yeah. Uh, let's say uh, you are now the booker. Let's say you've got six months or a year to the next WrestleMania. What would be the best way to uh, make Damien Priest connect with the fans and to be seen as a main eventer on 
the level of Roman Reigns, let's say? Um, this brings up a good point that we can tie in, probably. Um, what's the object of a wrestling match if you're an in-ring competitor? To win. To win. So how do you win a wrestling match, traditionally? By, by beating other people via submission or pinfall or knockout or whatever. Correct. Um, so I heard this maybe should, 25, a long time ago. I was a kid. I was in WCW. I was probably like 19. I heard Kevin Sullivan say this. He said, uh, you want to get somebody over, uh, put them on TV for six months. And basically, uh, he doesn't miss. He doesn't bump and he doesn't cover unless it's the finish. It'll be over. So now point to examples. Goldberg. Ultimate warrior. Right. Mm -hmm. You have guys who number one, don't miss. That means the shit that they try is successful. Nobody's ducking out of the way of shit. Nobody's countering shit. Nobody's got your offense figured out. You hit your shit, right? And even if it's something smart, like where, uh, you know, you go for something and the guy gets out of the corner, but you don't even fucking swing because you put the brakes on, then you grab the guy, throw him back in the corner and then take his head off. And that's a different level. That's putting over your opponent is smart, but you don't miss your shit. The second one is you don't bump. You don't leave your feet. You don't take a bump. You keep it special. Right. Third thing, you don't cover unless it's finished. That means nobody's ever seen anybody kick out of anything you do. And when you do cover, it's for the win. That motherfucker would be over. Now, the more you deviate from that, the less over that motherfucker could be. The less you deviate from that and the closer you get to that, the more over they're going to be. Now, with that win thing, um, Roman Reigns hasn't been pinned or submitted and going on two and a half years. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you had asked me something yesterday about wins and losses. Yes. A uh, road dog, maybe five or six years ago, once publicly tweeted that wins and losses don't matter when of course they do. Okay. And your question? I, I don't know. <laughs> I think I might have had a question for you. Do you know who says that? Uh, yeah, we went through this yesterday. Uh, the person okay, who yeah. says that is the person who was telling it to the guy taking the loss. Yeah, it's somebody who wants you to do a job. That's who tells you wins and losses don't matter. So somebody in creative could probably come to you. And if you had an issue with doing a job because you thought it hurt you, he could assure you that wins and losses don't matter mm -hmm. for you. You know, because you could easily say, well, then how about we just um, we go out there tonight and I'll beat Roman Reigns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, because they matter for Roman Reigns. They don't matter for you. <laughs> uh, we shall move on then. Uh, Seamus Ridge Holland versus New Day. Uh, it's not even no point talking about it. It was a throwaway match, less than two minutes. Uh, the Undertaker comes out, waves at the crowd, goes away, and then we've got one of the the sleeper match. I thought I thought it was maybe even easily the best match of the night. I really enjoyed it. Pat McAfee versus Austin Theory with Vince McMahon outside. Man, Pat McAfee's really good. Two matches this guy's had. He's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I heard um, somewhere that. In Indianapolis, he got a ring and he put it in a barn and he hired Rip Rogers to uh, coach him. Hmm. It's a brilliant move. And obvious uh, proofs in the pudding. Well, no, if Rip Rogers is a good coach, Pat McAfee. Hmm. Yeah. Rip Rogers, he trained you. A good Rip Rogers um, story. Or, or was he partially trained by you or, or not then? Uh, Rip was partially trained by me. I and what I mean by that, that. 
No, no, don't. Okay. Because it's funny because uh, when I first got on Twitter, um, uh, Rip, it, like people would go around and say like, okay, give this guy a follow. Give me a follow because I just started on Twitter, right? So then Rip uh, tweeted, his, I think it was Scotty Armstrong, and he said, um, Joey's so good that when he came to OBW, I learned from him and I was the trainer. So um, I put that on my resume. Yeah, Rip Rogers is, uh, but I learned a lot from Rip. Like, uh, he, he didn't train me, but uh, he, he could coach me, you know. He, I, and I would learn from watching him coach other people, too. He's, uh, he's as good a pro wrestling coach as I've ever seen. And um, he's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, but the people who have been uh, fortunate enough to spend time underneath that learning tree, um, it's their cup of tea, and those are the kind of people who are successful. He, he's he's good. Well, what's his style then? Is he like a drill sergeant? Is he because I imagine he's very upfront with what he likes and doesn't like. What does he teach you to do specifically that other guys don't say? And what does he refuse to teach people? Okay. <laughs> wow uh i need to charge you for a seminar then <laughs> find out whatever rip charges um so like rip is a uh, huge on making sure that the referee has the most amount of integrity as anybody in the entire territory as rules matter consequence matters the reason you're in a goddamn match the reason you're in a goddamn fucking phony wrestling match is seen on TV uh, is because you want to win that phony fucking wrestling match, right? And um, so you do that by either pinfall or submission. Now, if you want a submission, you'd be working a body part. Like, there's very logical shit. Like, um, it just, Rip, um, his psychology is impeccable. And he looks at it like a sport, and that's his filter. And that's also how he coaches. And we say drill sergeant. Um, we would do an hour of chain wrestling, technical wrestling, holds and counter holds uh, for an hour every day uh, at OVW. Just for that, just for that one particular thing, we would do an hour. And that was about being in shape and conditioning and just, you know, having a bit of goddamn self-respect and wanting to get good at your craft, you know, put some time in and become an expert and put in the work. And, um, but as far as a drill sergeant, um, I don't think so. Unless you're talking about the amount of drills he ran and he is a drill running motherfucker. Like anytime you see organized sports in any good team, you'll see a coach who um, either has had great success as a participant in that sport and, or, has found significant success in being a coach in that sport. And uh, his knowledge is impeccable, but he would have you be like one organized sports where it's a drill. It's like this man goes into the middle of the ring and then he takes on this man coming out of the corner and then this man coming out of the corner and then this man out of the corner and him, this man out of the corner and then this man goes to the corner and then the next man hits the ring and gets in the middle. And just repetition, 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 muscle memory, muscle memory, muscle memory. So the point is, Basically, if you can uh, go through holds and counter holds in the dark by yourself with your eyes closed, then when it comes time to being in the ring and all that second nature and it all just flows from you because you have a technical knowledge of how to move your body, then you can listen, you know, like you hear that siren? Yeah, just about. My ride's here. Yeah, my oh, ride's okay. here. <laughs> okay, no, but like uh, then – with that, with that knowledge you have with your body and the muscle memory and the performance, you can listen to the people and then you can start performing and ad-libbing and uh, not doing all that phony, goddamn, high spot, choreographed bullshit. As seen on TV, you said it before, but I believe that's one of Rip's uh, famous sayings. Rip has a lot of famous sayings that you ought not repeat in too many places. Do they all begin with fuck? Um, or end sometimes, fire. sometimes, sometimes, uh, you'd see somebody in the ring and you'd hear a bell and then you'd look over at the table and Rip would be standing there cause he rang the bell while two people were in the ring at training. And as you turn to him, uh, invariably you'd hear, get the fuck out. You're fucking rotten. <laughs> so they don't always begin with fuck. 
<laughs> but they're, they're very colorful. He knows his audience. He's always a crowd pleaser, mm. unless he's not. Oh, dear. Or unless he's in the uh, John Cougar Mellencamp videos. I like Rip Rogers yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to say about Pat McAfee? Uh, uh, I nearly called him Austin Aries. What's he called? He's called Austin Theory. Austin Theory. Thank you. Uh, anything else yeah. you want to mention to, <laughs> to that? Or should we move on was, to... What a, what a spectacle. Mm. It was amazing. Like, what a bunch of fun that was. You know? Uh, that was WrestleMania, man. That was awesome. Yeah. And then for some reason, like right after he did that schoolboy on Austin Theory, like I saw like Vince getting mad on the floor or whatever. He took off his shirt and took off his vest. And then my Peacock feed uh, went out until uh, Steve's music hit. That's not true, though, is it? You what? Did you did you maybe go hysterically blind from the sheer terrible match that unfolded between Vince McMahon and Pat McAfee? I don't know, man. I've had a lot of problems over the years. I could have blacked it out. You know? Mm. I could have been traumatized. I don't know. I've heard tell of what happened, but I don't... I don't know. I'm not really supposed to talk about it. Oh, well, I'll mention it very briefly. It's easily the worst match I think I've ever seen. Uh, to, That's yeah. impossible. That's impossible. It must be the worst match I've ever seen. I've not seen Heroes of Wrestling, though. You haven't? I've never seen Heroes of Wrestling. You know, the Bushwhackers and Nikolai Volkov and Iron Sheik. That's meant to be the worst match of all time. Man, never... they, okay, I'll say one thing, though. Mm -hmm. uh, um, okay, so then Steve comes out, and then it's just, you know, fun, fun, fun. And that live audience, as different as it might have been from the first night, gets to see Steve, and then he gets another moment. And Pat McAfee gets one, and then it's fun, 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 right? Um, I... <laughs> Uh, I imagine that there are some people who noticed that Vince McMahon didn't take the best stunner he ever took, right? Mm -hmm. and he's never took a good one, and this one was the worst, right? Mm -hmm. But is it because I've seen there's this show like, uh, remember Ted Turner? Uh, yes, so he's got TV stations over here, right? Yeah, and sometimes they they show some things, and uh, sometimes they show like stunners that are not that not that much better, and that's like a weekly, you know, episodically. Um, this guy's seventy six years old, and uh, for every year of his age, there's a thousand people watching it right there and yelling at it. So like, I don't know if that's like him and Pat McAfee had the worst match ever. Because, like, 76,000 people were yelling at it and watching it. But, um, yeah, it's uh, the execution's horrible. But I think Steve started laughing because it was so bad. Yeah. It's like you can't get mad at it, though, can you? Because you know it's going to be terrible. Just, but even, even that must have exceeded Steve's expectations. Of how rotten it was? Yeah, because he sort of kicked him. And Vince, as, as, for analyzing his sake, try, sort of like tries to like double over or something with the kick. And instead, he just completely yeah. loses his balance like he's 100 years old. <laughs> and yeah. then it takes like yeah, five I mean, seconds between the kick and the actual stunner. That's sad, too, because like we all remember Vince as being like such a like ring general and just like seamless with the athleticism from his younger days. <laughs> and like to see him now. Yo. Who, time though, father who, time. Who took the worst one, Vince or Linda? Oh, uh, well, Linda, yeah, maybe until Sunday night. But <laughs> but when you think about it, Linda hasn't you know had the practice or the reps either. So when you consider that, like that just puts it in perspective, like how bad Vince takes those. Yeah, and you wouldn't think he'd take him so bad. You wouldn't think he'd be that bad of a wrestler. Of all the people to be bad at wrestling, Vince McMahon, he's the worst. <laughs> but he's the worst actually had some good matches as well. I mean, that's, no... that's because that's because he's as good a worker as there's ever going to be. Nobody knows more about the business or ever will than Vince McMahon. He's God in the wrestling industry. You know, and that's like, you know, forever. So 
uh, he's had great matches because he's a great storyteller. And he knows what heat is. And he knows how to get somebody over. And he knows how to get heat. And he's got the platform to do it. So, Good for him. Um, what was I going to say then? Uh, is there anybody there who would have maybe tried to have taught Vince out? Listen, saying, you know, you're struggling to stand still here without falling over. Maybe you shouldn't do this. Or would just nobody ever say that to him? It's like, hey, it's Vince. It's Vince's company. He gets to do whatever he wants. I don't know who's there, but what you just asked is, is it Vince's company? Vince gets to do whatever he wants. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Always. However, I don't know who's next to him. I don't know who's saying, Hey boss, that was great. You look great. Cause it was great. And he looks how he looks, but like if they said that was the best stunt I've ever seen, I don't know. I don't know what people say. To him. <laughs> If, if people want money and people want a job from him, they probably kiss his ass and tell him it's great. I don't know. Probably tell him what they think he wants to hear. Because they care more, they care more about keeping their job than they do about putting out a good product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we are going to move to the main event then. Uh, Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns in the biggest WrestleMania match of all time. The most mm -hmm. stupendous match of all time. And before we go into the match itself, I'm sure you've got opinions on it. Uh, Couple of questions. Working with Paul Heyman, did you ever work closely with Paul Heyman? Um, I mean, because he was the writer of SmackDown, wasn't he? When you were in the Eminem tag team, did you ever work with him when he was purely just talent as a manager for Brock Lesnar? Uh, yeah, all the time. Um, I met Paulie when I was like um, nineteen, probably twenty years old, and I. I'm the youngest ECW original ever, and I always will be because it, it's dead. Mm -hmm. And so, like, um, I worked for Paul when I was 20. I was on uh, full-time ECW when, uh, for the last eight months of uh, its existence. And then I worked with him. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was involved with SmackDown. And then when he took over for Jimmy Cornette and OVW, uh, he would come in and write TV. And then I would come in off the road from SmackDown tapings on Tuesday. And on Wednesdays, I would go to the Davis Arena while I was WWE Tag Team Champion and uh, help write TV with Paulie, OVW TV with Paulie when I was like 25 or so. And um, uh, then I worked with him. Jeez, man. Uh, when he came back uh, to work with Brock in probably 2012 or 13 and worked with him. I, I was an agent on a lot of Brock's segments, a lot of my, Brock's matches and pay-per-views. and um, So I got to work with Paulie closely for, for a lot of that. So, yeah, my experience with Paulie it goes, uh, spans uh, three decades almost. I don't know. Yeah. I uh, I love to hear the stories when Paul was writing for SmackDown and just how bitter a rivalry it was, or they were trying to conjure up between SmackDown and Raw at the time. When you were on SmackDown, this isn't where I was going to go with it, but I will now, is when you were on SmackDown, was it like a genuine sense of rivalry with Raw, with the big brand splits at the time? Uh, I can only speak from my experience and when I was involved with it, uh... On the road, full time. I think two thousand five, six, and seven during that era. Um, and I know that for me, the, there is there is a great amount of pride taken in that being the blue brand being the brand. And yeah, we weren't on USA Network, and yeah, we didn't get the ratings, and we didn't feel like we got the attention, and we didn't have the three hours, or you know, um, felt like. You know, neglected child kind of, but you look at the top and right there in the back of the bus, you got, you know, the Undertaker on one, you got JB on the other, and then you got, uh, you know, when I started, it was, um, you know, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, Booker T, Bob Holly, Batista, John Cena, JBL, Undertaker, just, you know, a very different look from what it is now, you know, Rey Mysterio, I mean, just, so many guys that were um, all-time greats. And when you have that group, 
uh, it's a matter of pride. You know, we always kind of like wanted, it starts at the top. So if Undertaker's in the locker room and he's on your show because he's on your crew and you're on the blue team, that's his brand. That's his show, SmackDown's Taker's show. So if you're on that show, you're going to do everything you can to earn that. Because if, if you weren't worthy of being on Undertaker's show, you, you wouldn't be there long. You would last, you know? So it was a, it was a matter of pride. Yeah, that, that was very real for a while, I think. Mm. To uh, a lot of guys. I, I'll go back to Paul Heyman uh, then for a minute. What period of time when you were working either for Paul or with Paul, did you enjoy, the, did you enjoy Paul's company and working with him the most? So imagine you didn't spend too much time with him in ECW. Um, well, too much time. Uh, that's hard to say. Like at ECW TV, uh, after the TV taping is when you would do your promos and you do them for the following weeks and the following shows. And that could be a whole locker room of guys. So by, you know, if I'm as 20 years old and, you know, three, four years into the business, or that was my fifth year, I don't know what it was, but like, I'm young. I'm the newest guy in ECW. So my promos are going to be last. So then I get to watch Paul E conduct all these interviews and produce all these interviews and promos with different talent. And then if it's like, you know, a real top talent that I'm not familiar with or it needs to be somewhere else or it needs to be quiet, I might not be there, but I'll still be in the building and talking to cameramen or talking to somebody else who's uh, not involved with what they're doing right at that minute. So it was a great educational experience. And then the be there at 2 or 3 a.m. and listen to Paul E. and listen to his theories and his stories and his teachings uh, were great. And then there was, um, like I recall one time after a uh, pay-per-view or um, a big event in New York City, I ended up going to uh, Sarge's Deli with Paul E. like way late, like after midnight. And uh is his assistants he really loved that place but like yeah just going out to eat with them then and like um so i spent a a good deal of time around them i'd say and then all throughout the years like since i knew him since i was a kid uh like we always got on like i saw him a few years ago at an airport just passed and i've been out of the business for a little bit i think um and uh just saw him in passing and he came over uh like from one restaurant i came over from like where train was and yeah we embraced and he's paulie's always going to be somebody i have a lot of time for with um paulie i'll ask one more question then is and we could do we could do five hours talking about uh paul Heyman, i'm sure but uh and this is a very condensed version of uh you know your experiences with him but as far as on-screen talent as a manager Everybody's always got their favourites of managers and it always depends on what area you grew up in. You could have Jim Cornette, you could have Bobby Heenan, maybe Gary Hart, maybe Captain Lou Albano, etc. For you, where does Paul Heyman rank as far as great managers? I'd say seventh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know what the uh, criteria is. You know, like, um, does he know everything? Yeah. Uh, what he doesn't, I mean, he knows a little bit about it. And if not, he can guess the rest. Like he knows what he's doing and he knows why he does it. And everything is so well thought out and everything is to get everybody involved as over as it can be. So then a uh, fucking high tide rises all ships. So then they all get over. Like he doesn't get involved with things that aren't going to be successful. He, um, uh, there's different aspects. If you ask me like who took, uh, who was the best at physicality, I would say Jimmy Cornette took a hell of a fucking bump. Jimmy Cornette did great stuff. And it looked like um, the physicality that Jimmy would be capable of doing and pulling off. It wasn't a stretch, but then Bobby Heenan, he's a guy who was a wrestler before he was a manager. So his physicality was off the charts. If you've seen some of his stuff, you just go the extra mile for a baby face. Instead of taking a punch and rolling off, you take the punch, turn around, take the buckle, take the post between the buckle and fall out over the top rope and just go crazy. Paul Lee can't do a thing physically. He can't. Sorry. And then he knows, he knows he can't do anything physically. So you never see him involved in anything with physicality because he knows he can't. And um, like, uh 
but as far as like promo and as far as getting this talent over and getting the story and the business over, there's nobody's better. I, I think he's probably the best. I, I really do. And the work he's he's done, um, it used to be a thing too, like where anybody who gets managed by Paul Lee um, once he had the run with Brock, nobody else was going to be able to really – Get it, you know. I, I know they tried to deal with Joe Hennig for a while, um, Curtis Axel, and he's not Brock, you know. And uh, I know uh, he's had a couple other guys. Some of the guys like could talk, so they didn't really need him as much. And but to have a run like he had with Brock, uh, it was going to be hard to even duplicate that. And I don't know if he's exceeded it because I don't know the business numbers, but the work he's doing with Roman Reigns is uh, is tremendous for me. And watching Roman Reigns is um, is really special to me because I remember on his day one in the business at FCW, and I knew his brother and I know his family, and I coached him from day one. And I remember like on Wednesdays at uh, at uh, Dreams promo class. Um, you know, I go out there and sit with them, and I, I remember always telling them one day they're going to hitch the wagon to you, the entire thing, you know, and to see that um, I'm right. You know, what a guy, what a man that guy is. And, uh, and the work he's done with Paul Lee is, I think it's some of the best stuff I've ever seen or can remember seeing just um, who he's become. He's, he's finally found himself, you know, and the work he's done with his uh, nephews, there's nephews, they're not his cousins, but uh, <laughs> so, uh, the work he's done with his family is um, exceptional. I, I think it's the best thing on TV and it's so good that after this match that we saw with Brock, it's hard to, um, it's hard to pick somebody who would be credible opponent to Roman Reigns. Mm-hmm. Uh, just watching these two TV shows, I don't. Or watching these pay per views. Then what do you do then? Well, if it ain't broke, don't break it. So you got a guy now uh, who's got both titles, and he's by far got the best look. By far got the best promo. By far got the best work. I think you keep those things where they're at. And then you got guys there. You look at um, Braun Breaker. You look at Austin Theory. You look at some of these young guys. And you can tell, like, uh, we're not too far away with some of these guys, you know. And... uh, in the meantime, you can elevate guys. Like, I think there's an edge in Roman Reigns promo. Or not edge, I'm sorry. Uh, like, there's guys like Damian Priest who would benefit from having some interaction. I don't know what interaction they've had until this point, but I think you keep Roman as special as you can because if he's the golden goose right now, you just protect him, you know, because if you try to pass it around, I think you dilute what's, what's the main thing right now. Uh, I'm. Uh, I don't think I've asked you this. Is Roman Reigns? I know you're a big fan of Roman Reigns. I know your history is you work with the Shield very closely, and you love all three guys uh, from the Shield. Roman Reigns as a main eventer. Uh, y- y- you know, if you were assigned a, a point score, to, you know, for look, ability, interview, where does Roman Reigns around Austin, Rock, Cena, Hogan? all the big hitters from the decades before, where does Roman Reigns rank, do you think? Um, at this stage, it's hard to say. Um, it, it, and it depends on what you're talking about. If it's for a household name, he's not at the level of The Rock. Rocky is the biggest movie star in the world. Nobody's going to be on that level. Uh, Hulk Hogan is also a relative household name still, I think. I think people have talked about TV wrestling. What do you mean? Like Hulk Hogan? You'd go, oh, right. 
and kind of know what that is. Um, I don't know. You get that if you say Roman Reigns, you know, uh, and I don't think he's on the level of uh, John Cena. I think John Cena's star is rising as long as John Cena is doing something and breathing in and out. John Cena goes like this. And uh, who else are we talking about? Steve Austin? Steve as far Austin, as, uh, Ultimate Warrior, Bruno San Martino. Okay, well, you're talking about different eras. And you're talking about when uh, Rocky and Steve were on TV and Hulk was on TV at WCW. How many people were watching TV? 10 million people? 8 million people? I don't know. Uh, now you have Raw draws, what, a million and a half eyes to it, and SmackDown draws 2.2, maybe 2 million. Yeah, around that, yeah. So SmackDown's surpassed Raw and not the B show anymore. And the guy at the helm was Roman Reigns. Uh, but that is what four times less people than watched Rocky and Austin. So, no, he's not bigger than they are, not bigger names. He doesn't draw more. Uh, there's more out there, I think, and less people are watching the rest of it. You know, so, uh, but as far as durability, longevity, Six WrestleMania main events is fucking nothing to sneeze at. And to be a guy that could probably do six more easy. I mean, I, the, I don't know um, how you can quantify Roman Reigns being better than the Ultimate Warrior or Bruno San Martino or how Bruno was better than the Warrior, Warrior was better than Bruno. I just think Roman Reigns is by far the best thing in wrestling today. He's one of the best characters and best things I've ever seen. And this incarnation of Roman is the, one of the best things I've ever seen as far as a fan. It's so well done. I will uh, I'll ask one more question, then I will thank you for your time. We'll wrap up the show. Um, during your reign as producer, I'm sure over the years you heard fans on the internet or, some, or people within the company just saying, you need to turn Roman you know, bad guy, and it took so many years to do it, and now he has turned bad guy, it was the best thing for his career. Uh, who was, like, the biggest resistor of turning him uh, heel earlier on? Um, in WWE, there's a, there's a saying backstage that uh, there's an audience of one. Okay, so who is the biggest resistor? I don't know. Who's was the biggest resistor to keeping him face? Doesn't matter. He was kept face. Why? That's what Vince wanted to do. That's what Vince thought was best, you know? And, um, you know, people didn't know that Ouse had uh, leukemia. And that's what uh, got him out of football. People didn't know that. People didn't know he was a cancer survivor. And so he had the second bout. I remember when we were struggling, you know, trying to find it, trying to get him over. I'd ask Hunter, you know, like we'd be in production meetings. I remember texting Hunter from two tables back to the front table right there, just texting while the meeting's going on. Like, um, you know, is it time to mention uh, the illness? Because it'd be like, invariably it'd be around like, uh, what was it? It was October. It was the uh, breast cancer where we had the uh, pink ropes mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah, the Susan so D. Coleman thinking, thing. Right. So then I was thinking, like, well, with the cancer awareness and tie-in and everything, like, you know, it sparked that with that coming up. I didn't know if, like, we should do that beforehand or, like, months before. And I was asking her, like, do you think now's the time? It's like, no, Vince doesn't want to touch that. You know, and I can understand that. And nobody else knew about it. Like, I was one of the few people who knew about the sickness that drove him out. People didn't know he was a cancer survivor and thought, like, man, if people knew what kind of guy this was, like, what kind of fucking man this guy was and how tough this son of a bitch was and how, how this guy's the motherfucker, uh, like, they, they wouldn't be able to help but, like, I mean, give him money, <laughs> you know, and come off their wallets for this guy because he's a superhero. He really is. And, um, yeah, there was a big push to like not swim upstream and just go with whatever. But Roman going through everything he went through, like from the time at WrestleMania 31, uh, two days before, 
And when I had to tell him in the hallway of the hotel that he was not going to defeat Brock Lesnar after everything we did for the last year, you know, after Brock broke the streak, after Brock killed John Cena at SummerSlam, after, you know, Suplex City, all that, we're not going to put Roman over. And I had to tell him in the hallway of the hotel and to see that and just see him say, you know, smile and go, okay, well, it's going to be great. And then, you know, to be on the bus with Brock and laying that match out the night before. And just, there's stories that, you know, viewers will be interested in probably. Mm -hmm. And if not, then uh, I still am. And um, with Roman going through all those disappointments, all the times he went out there and had to say things that were scripted for him that were so fucking far-fetched and so stupid and not him. And how many times he had to go out there and work 40 minute matches in fucking Toledo, Ohio, you know, and just like bust his ass and give everything he did all that shit. It took all that shit. And it takes what it takes to get where you are. And it took all that for him to become the man he is, that he can say, this is my microphone. This is my camera. Don't you understand that this is my set that I walk out of to make me look good. And then the announcers, they're for me. And they're going to talk about me and how good I look up on that set to all the people who are at home watching their TVs. And when we watch their TVs, they're going to see this backdrop that says WrestleMania. And they're going to see me in front of it with a microphone because this is all for me. And that WrestleMania sign, I am WrestleMania. And he can mean all that shit. And it comes across as very, very true and realistic. And he knows that and he knows who he is, but he wouldn't be able to pull any of this off if he hadn't gone through all the shit he went through. And that's why he's special. And nobody's gone through what he's gone through. So nobody is who he is. A fine, uh, a fine way to a fine way to sort of wrap up the podcast. And uh, I would think we'll go through what we've learned. So every single match, I think there were 16, they all went to the floor. Yes. Wins and losses definitely do matter um for some for some not if, for Brock if we want to get you if we want to if we want to get you over they're dire yeah uh but they don't matter for Brock Lesnar because he lost that day not on that night here real quick ask me if uh wrestling's fake is wrestling fake when i lose mhm mm yeah, it's fake when I lose. I see. <laughs> yeah. You were so still, I actually thought that the screen had frozen. Yeah, no, I'm just <laughs> very dead. <laughs> Otherwise, like, when I go over, wrestling's a complete shoot. Hmm. And wins and losses matter. <sighs> but when I don't, it's fake, because they don't matter. Uh, what, a, what better way can we end on the podcast? Uh, don't, is there anything you want to add, or shall I, uh, shall I close up with the world's longest outro? Oh, I'd love a long outro. Lengthy uh, one, yeah. Yeah, a good lengthy one. So uh, I will thank you very much for your time, Joey. I'll thank you very much for watching. And this isn't going to be a long outro. I'll just thank everybody. And you'll be coming on again? Uh, if you'd be kind enough to have me. I think we can uh, definitely do that. But for now, thank you very much, Joey. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll catch you again whenever I catch you again. Cheers. <laughs>